Welcome everybody to today's Credit and Connection. I am here today with TransUnion's Jim Van Dyke. Welcome. Thank you, Sarah. Great to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Um, tell us a little bit about your background, because that's really going to help set up what we're talking about today. Sure. I've worked in digital commerce and digital finance or fintech for uh, my entire career, which is a, a long time. And um, got my start in uh, in fintech, actually lock, launching web banking to credit unions around 1995. Um, that was before fintech was a term even, I think. <laughs> that's right. You know, e-commerce and fintech were, were terms back then. So yeah, it was very <laughs> early days. You had to pretty much figure everything out that's taken for granted today. And fun times. And along the way, um, you know, as new things rolled out on top of what was then called home banking, uh, you know, we, we learned a lot about what creates um, value for members and customers and what how that turns into um, the ability to have these solutions pay for themselves for credit unions. Like we especially learned that engagement is often much more um, powerful in terms of paying the way for these solutions in uh, rather than just cost avoidance, or in, in the case of what I'm about to talk to you, fraud avoidance. Those are important, but how it affects the relationship with members is much more powerful. So I've done this for a long time, and a couple of other things that I've done along the way are um, launching a research company the name was Javelin Strategy and Research. So I founded and ran that organization for 14 years and I sold it to a, a, a New York um, equity firm. And it still serves the largest banks today and advising you about digital banking and fraud, especially member or customer facing elements. And I became, an, after I sold Javelin, an expert witness on the nation's top data breaches. So. Equifax, Yahoo, Anthem, all the ones that set records in terms of, of class action, mm -hmm. excuse me, judgments. I was the primary expert witness. And while doing that work as a researcher, bringing very much a quant background into things, I realized that I was making a lot of money for trial attorneys, but very little of it was going to consumers. And that troubled me greatly. And I, I realized that the method that I created for the court which was essentially a research-based method using Federal Trade Commission, Javelin Department of Justice research methods to understand how any data compromise elevates uh, a particular pattern of risk for a consumer. So just let me all unpack that for a minute, then I'll, then I'll wrap up the um, long answer to your question about background. The, you know, if you've been in, for example, the T-Mobile breach, that's your most recent breach. And the most recent breach I was in was um, Anthem's big one or OPM or something else. You and I have a different pattern of fraud risk along with a different level of fraud risk. And the logic is pretty simple, but we turned it into a 1300 element algorithm in my product. So it's true AI expert systems. I mean, you can understand the logic from a common sense perspective and how this builds on the expert witness work, and that if your SSN was exposed in a recent breach, you know, we all know what SSNs are use, useful for. If you're a cyber criminal, that would be like new credit account fraud or IRS refund fraud. But combined, those types of fraud risk represent less than 30% of all U.S. identity fraud. So if I was in a breach that didn't expose my SSN, but it exposed my payment card digits, <clears throat> along with the uh, three or four digit secret code, you know, common sense informs us that I'm at risk of online payment of card fraud, payment of card fraud, pardon me. So if you break that into a very specific algorithm, you say, based on what was exposed in, for in individual victims, what is their particular pattern of risk and what action should they take? So again, long answer your question that I turned that into an algorithm that became a member or customer facing product because um, we, we want to stop making it so hard for consumers to figure out what they should do to reduce their unique level and pattern of identity fraud risk. 
Right. And that's exactly uh, what we're talking about today. Your personalized um, identity uh, risk. Um, I know I didn't say that correctly, but <laughs> um, talk a little bit about that because it was uh, it was featured at uh, Finnovate Spring just uh, last month. Yeah, that's right. And we previously have won the Finnovate Best of Show Award for it. And so, yeah, the product, um, because everybody's been breached and everyone will continue to be breached and many of those breaches are findable. So we take everyone's breach history and we, we run that through our expert systems algorithm. This happens very fast. So when we pull that data, it says, um, because every breach is on the public record, it feeds into our algorithm so we can identify what that that unique pattern of identity theft or fraud risk is, and then prescribe actions. And our research tells us quite clearly that consumers are not lazy, they're not hypocritical, they're, they're not un, unwilling to help to partner with credit unions to um, help fight identity theft and fraud, most of which is likely to occur at their primary FI. They just need to have it made simple for them. So the product we showed pulled on that unique data breach history. And again, that happens in seconds. So we um, identify a level just like a credit score. And that's why TransUnion bought this product that was originally my second startup. It's called Breach Clarity. It's now called Breach IQ. And it creates an identity safety score, zero to 100. Other than that, it's like a credit score you know, where higher is better. And we tell consumers what their top identity fraud risks are. So if for you, using my previous example, it's new credit fraud and it's IRS fraud, then we are only going to tell you, and this is what we showed at Finnovate, that you need to freeze your credit. And of course, that's a good idea for a lot of people, but for some people, it's essential. Mm -hmm. And when there are 50, five, zero different actions you should take, Narrowing that down to a short list is really important. It's like if you saw your doctor and you said, what can I do to be more healthy? And he gives you a list of 50 things. You go, which one should be first? They go, I don't know. You're not going to do anything. That's the, that's why consumers aren't taking action today. So at Finnovate, we showed how breach history converts to an identity safety score, a zero to 100 scale a prioritized set of fraud risks and a prioritized set of actions, all in a UX that sits right behind the login of a credit union or a bank. Okay. So within the mobile or digital banking experience. Awesome. That's right. Yeah, but it's right there. There's no like going to hunt for it either. Um, so, I mean, one of the things um, that I read about the product is that it, it uses this AI algorithm to personalize the, the identity risk assessment. So was something like this even possible before AI? Yeah, that's a great, um, no, no, it wasn't. And because when, <laughs> just to give you a, a factual answer for that, um, you know, when I worked on my first data breach expert witness case, it was the Anthem data breach. and. Mm -hmm. It took me over a hundred hours to compute with great accuracy, you know, the kind that could hold up to um, cross-examination um, in a legal um, setting, which is grueling. If it, you know anybody listening has ever seen, you know, that kind of grueling testimony, I, I, you know, I, it's as stressed out as I've ever been. And one of those was 14 hours where you have to show, um, not just spend a lot of time like the, 100 plus hours I calculated and saying, if you're in that big Anthem data breach, what's your risk pattern? Well, I had to show that that came from a certain set of logic that is, that is based on research. And you know, obviously there's no way a consumer will do that on their own. They don't have the background, they don't have the time, but I was hired to do that. And that's when I said, well, I'm following the structured method that then when I went on to be the main expert witness in Yahoo or other other cases, like a dozen of them. I applied the same process, but with a different set of variables, a different breached identity credentials. So that's again another long way of, of saying 
yeah, there's no way a member will do that on their own. It's hypothetically possible, but we all know it never would be possible. So that's the beauty of AI is you could do that in milliseconds now. Yeah, no. So how much, how is AI changing the field of fraud, prevention, recovery, um, all that? Yeah, yeah. You know, in most of the hype, you know, mo most of the well-deserved hype around AI right now is around generative AI. Mm -hmm. There are several different AI categories, which is why most vendors say, hey, we're AI. And people can't, it's ridiculous. You know, probably, you know, the small minority of vendors are truly AI. But in generative AI, which is really about creating content, publishable content, um, that's where most of the investment money is and most of the real traction is today. We're not Gen AI. We're about, again, expert systems, making decisions that theoretically could be made by people, but you know, your member never would. And mm -hmm. so most AI that's uh, applicable by credit unions today would either be in generative AI for content, like on a website or something, or it's used by um, some um, fraud prevention vendors, be, but in a behind the scenes um, nature. And you know, TransUnion does this as well, but that's for products that are used by say heads of fraud mitigation in a credit union for their own use. And that's all well and good, but I mean, the problem with our uh, massive ongoing identity fraud problem that will continue to be an ongoing problem because of crimes of impersonation are the best way to take money from a bank or a credit union or a card issuer or whatever. Credit unions are mainly fighting this problem through their enterprise fraud mitigation full-time staff. And that's good. We should keep doing that. But with almost all of these losses happening through the member or in the name of the member, you have to partner with a member. And if you don't, Bank of America will figure out a way to do it first or Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. And they'll get a tighter relationship with their customer before you do. Yeah. And that, of course, can damage trust pretty significantly, even if mm -hmm. it's not on you, even if it is on Target or Home Depot or whoever the breach, uh, you know, corporate victim is. Um, but it always comes back to that uh, card issuer. Um, so then also on the flip side, too, criminals are getting like great <laughs> new tools as well. Um, I was reading that. Um, let me see that uh, note on the data point here that it's the fraud is at the highest level in, in two years and, and first quarter 24 over first quarter 23 is 31% increase. What are yeah. some of the new trends and tools that you're seeing that these guys are using to make it faster, better, cheaper? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you already asked about AI because generative AI is being used by criminals right. in these scam attempts. And Every case of identity theft or fraud, again, which is the main way financial institutions are defrauded, defrauded is through identity fraud, that um, it's, it's what I call a two crime crime, meaning there are two separate um, events that may be the same criminal or maybe two separate criminals working in a partnership conduct. And the first one is compromising the data and the second one is misusing the data that's been compromised. And it's really important to realize that it's generally a two-step process and where scams, you know, so the data might be breached or otherwise compromised, you know, it could be a phishing attempt or, or something else. But these uh, attempts at fooling the consumer into thinking that they're making a, a smart or a prudent uh, effort at something you know, under the guise of a fake emergency or whatever else, um, you know, those used, the advice that used to make sense for members is, you know, look for the misspelling or the funky graphics or whatever. And with generative AI being so usable and the tools being so widely available by criminals, you know, we can no longer rely on that as the first point of advice for consumers. We actually have to be careful with that because, you know, the inverse of that advice to consumers is if is if you can't find a mistake, it's probably trustworthy. Well, that's now horrible advice. Right. right? right. And so we, and, and I, I get, um, I, I had um, 
an email from my financial institution the other day advising me inside the email to click on a link. And I thought, oh, it's just awful advice. <laughs> and people, so people are still doing that. So yeah, criminals have embraced AI. They're, they're faster at innovation than even the fastest FI will be at innovation. And therefore, we need to deploy solutions that partner with the member. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, getting right back to that personalized identity risk um, assessment. So um, they're of particular importance right now because of the severity of data breaches, too, because uh, mm -hmm. I think TransUnion, from what I understand, kind of takes that data in aggregate and looks right. at it as well. And so what are you finding in aggregate that's that's happening yeah, so in the so the, there's two unique things we do that came from my startup, now a part of TransUnion, are um, and again applying uh, expert systems AI. We both score the breach or the data compromise event, just like an earthquake or a hurricane or or whatever. Um, you know, where um, and in that case, in the case of breaches, every single publicly reported U.S. breach, every breach that gets reported to a state attorney's general which are dozens every day in the United States. Um, we give a score to, and in that case, a higher score is worse. So if there are a few tens, there aren't many, you know, each signs are tens, most breaches are ones or twos or threes. Thankfully, we're generally, it's login information, but we saw in the first quarter, a skyrocketing amount of breaches involving SSNs. So we apply our AI to that instantaneously. So we can, um, and, and, it can help credit unions and others identify which particular breaches not only raise risk more, but what they should do, what kinds of action they should take in anticipating fraud. And sometimes these breaches are regional, like it might be just maybe um, con, uh, con members who are paying a water bill for a certain city and that municipal district or that local hospital was breached. So then we score the consumer's identity, which represents all the data compromises, not just one, but all the data compromise events they've been in. So we apply that, and that's their identity safety score that I, I likened to a credit score earlier. Mm -hmm. And so we believe that rather than treating all breaches the same or every consumer's identity risk, that we should harness AI to start personalizing those to make action more simple. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a great point you made earlier, too, about <clears throat> getting an email from your bank or your credit union, I can't remember which, I got, you know, I've gotten emails that I don't real, I think are fraud and actually are real. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, that's definitely, obviously not one of the tips we want to give people anymore, or maybe shouldn't have to begin with now that we look back on it, but what, what can credit unions do to help their members to avoid becoming a victim? And what can the credit unions do for themselves to, to, cause this is a huge cost for credit unions. It's $30 or so to reissue cards for every single right. member that gets hit. So. Right. Yeah. You know, and credit unions as well as other financial institutions are generally doing a, a good job of protecting data from getting breached. So I'm not saying back off of those efforts, but when you look at the financial industry compared to other industry industries, that's not where the data leakage is happening. It's happening in healthcare institutions, number one, um, educational institutions, number two, and it's generally happening with third-party providers, like third-party firms that have, in the case of a credit union member data. But again, it's it's other industries that are leaking the data. So I'd say keep mm -hmm. up the the work through credit union associations on penalizing firms that keep getting breached, largely in the healthcare sector or educational sector. But so we have to focus on the fraud, not the breach. And in focusing on uh, um, the the um, on the fraud, I mean that's where the partnership communication is particularly important, and it is a real opportunity. So we found that consumers do remember. You know, they, they do notice when they've been breached. Or, or, I, may, I said that wrong, sorry. Consumers are very concerned when they've been breached, but organizations that are required by law to notify consumers do a really sneaky job of consuming, co confusing consumers. You know, they start out with these data breach letters and we've all received them. They're a lot longer than they need to be by design. 
They're intentionally confusing. They're written above the eighth grade level that is advisable for the general public. And they start out with a, the same statement and saying, we don't, we have no reason to believe that you, uh, your data was used in fraud, which is a horrible self-serving statement mm -hmm. and that no consumer should ever be told. So in that, you know, if, if I were like writing communication materials to help members know how to protect themselves from possible fraud, fraud that's most likely to occur on the FI in a deposit or a card account. And that makes up the majority of all ID fraud. That's when you consider new credit, tax, all those categories combined. I would tell people to, um, it, when they get a breach notice, you know, make sure they, they check their updates because uh, those those notices often don't, don't get seen by consumers because they go to a spam folder or other folders. And I'm convinced that FIs are writing them so they look like um, like garbage marketing. And again, I do I, I say this from an expert witness perspective um, that not just casual observer. So when they do that, tell the consumer to think about what kinds of fraud are more is most likely to occur. You know, if it was an SSN that was exposed, and again in Q1 we saw a record amount of SSN exposures from breaches. So focus on the kinds of um, online actions that consumers use SSNs for, which again would be new credit or tax refund fraud, or if it was your payment card, you know, and hopefully that wasn't the credit union. Um, you know, the credit if the credit union knows about that, they've probably already um, reissued the card. But it might be a member that has a Bank of America credit card or American Express card. And this is a great opportunity to outservice that credit union competitor and say, well, let's help you protect your credit card information. Um, now you need to scrutinize your statement and double up on alerts if you haven't done it. The credit unions can pitch the consumer on their own alerts, tell them about their own controls that they offer the consumer if they're strong, and hopefully they are. So really getting specific, uh, which for some members might be saying, you know, just call a member service rep, go into a branch if, if you happen to be near one and you can have a conversation because one of the problems with all this identity fraud risk and all these scams is it's creating fraud that breaks relationships, makes people leave credit unions for others because then, you know, if, Fraud occurs in somebody's account and the consumer confuses crime number one, the breach that occurred at the healthcare agency that created fraud in a, in a card account. Consumer can't figure that out. So it's better for the credit union to offer help in understanding the fraud risk before they lose the member or before fraud happens. And then now the call center is jammed with a freaked out member. Mm -hmm. Yep. Or uh, I think probably all financial institutions have been through that. I've certainly have when uh, I think I, it was the target one uh, several years ago now, but yeah, uh, yeah, I got hit then. Um, so, all right, we're at the point. Uh, well, I want to say too, I love what you're talking about with communications, obviously that's what I'm about, but uh, yeah, uh, communicating more frequently, more clearly, your disclosure doesn't have to be five pages long. <laughs> it could be three mm -hmm. sentences. Yeah. Um, uh, so all that, um, I really appreciate because consumer protection isn't consumer protection if they can't understand what you're even telling them. Um, and you know, you were talking about eighth grade level. I have a master's degree and <laughs> I've been a professional editor for 25 years. I can't read it sometimes. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, I'm going to go with, uh, uh, we're about to wrap up here because I know uh, I appreciate your time and I don't want to um, take up too much of it, but I'm going to go ahead and give you the final thoughts as our guest. What, do we, what are your parting thoughts for our audience? Yeah, when we've asked consumers what prevents them from addressing their number one financial area of interest, which is always cyber and identity safety, that's always number one in interest. They continue to tell us in survey after survey that it's the feeling of being either, either confused or overwhelmed in the major, for the majority of consumers. That's why they don't take action. And I personally have gone to all the sites that 
pop up if you Google terms like, what are the best ways to protect my identity from identity fraud? And they're not good. You know, they're, 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 the advice is bad, the advice is generic. So this is a, a strong credit union opportunity to strengthen relationships and to do it faster and better, you know, more effectively, in other words, than the banks. But we see the banks taking moves in these areas, and um, some of them are reaching out to us. So it's if you look at both uh, Bank of America and Wells Fargo have started to uh, give tailored advice, but credit unions, we think because of the their higher authentic priority on right. member well-being, have a have a great opportunity to outpace banks in this area. Yeah, I love it exactly. I don't need a, I need, I don't need to say anything more. You said it all. Well, thank you very much for your time, Jim. I appreciate you uh, joining us today. Yeah, great to be here, Sarah. Thank you for taking the time with me.